Fantastic Audio presents the collected stories of Arthur C. Clarke, 1956 to 1961, the songs of distant earth and other stories, performed by Theodore Bickell, David Burney, Scott Brick, Christopher Casimir, Ira Claffey, Gabrielle DeCure, Robert Forster, Richard Gilliland, Caressa McElhaney, Jeanwell Pozo, Stefan Rudnicki, Jean Smart, and William Wyndham. Moving Spirit, first published in Tales of the White Heart. In this tale from the White Heart, Harry Purvis introduces us to a genuine mad scientist living in an out-of-the-way part of Cornwall, which is coincidentally where Charles Willis, or should I say Arthur C. Clarke, spent part of his wartime service. We were discussing a sensational trial at the Old Bailey, when Harry Purvis, whose talent for twisting the conversation to his own ends is really unbelievable, remarked casually, I was once an expert witness in a rather interesting case. Only a witness, said Drew, as he deftly filled two glasses of bass at once. Yes, but it was rather a close thing. It was in the early part of the war, about the time we were expecting the invasion. That's why you never heard about it at the time. What makes you assume, said Charles Willis suspiciously, that we never did hear of it? It was one of the few times I'd ever seen Harry caught trying to cover up his tracks. Keys excuse, accuse, I thought to myself, and waited to see what evading action he'd take. It was such a peculiar case, he replied with dignity, that I'm sure you'd have reminded me of it if you ever saw the reports. My name was featured quite prominently. It all happened in an out-of-the-way part of Cornwall, and it concerns the best example of that rare species, the genuine mad scientist that I've ever met. Perhaps that wasn't really a fair description, Purvis amended hastily. Homer Ferguson was eccentric and had little foibles like keeping a pet burr constrictor to catch the mice and never wearing shoes around the house, but he was so rich that no one noticed things like that. Homer was also a competent scientist. Many years ago he had graduated from Edinburgh University, but having plenty of money he had never done a stroke of real work in his life. Instead, he potted round the old vicarage he had bought not far from Newquay and amused himself building gadgets. In the last forty years, he'd invented television, ballpoint pens, jet propulsion, and a few other trifles. However, as he had never bothered to take out any patents, other people had got the credit. But this didn't worry him in the least, as he was of a singularly generous disposition, except with money. It seemed, in some complicated way, Purvis was one of his few living relatives. Consequently, when Harry received a telegram one day, requesting his assistance at once, he knew better than to refuse. No one knew exactly how much money Homer had, or what he intended to do with it. Harry thought he had as good a chance as anyone, and he didn't intend to jeopardize it. At some inconvenience, he made the journey down to Cornwall and turned up at the vicarage. He saw what was wrong as soon as he entered the grounds. Uncle Homer, he wasn't really an uncle, but he'd been called that as long as Harry could remember, had a shed beside the main building which he used for his experiments. That shed was now minus roof and windows, and a sickly odour hovered around it. There had obviously been an explosion. And Harry wondered, in a disinterested sort of way, if Uncle had been badly injured and wanted advice on drawing up a new will. He ceased daydreaming when the old man, looking the picture of health, apart from some sticking plaster on his face, opened the door for him. What have you to come so quickly? He boomed. He seemed genuinely pleased to see Harry. Then his face clouded over. Fact is, my boy, I'm in a bit of a jam. I want you to help. My case comes up before the local bench tomorrow. This was a considerable shock. 
Homer had been as law-abiding a citizen as any motorist in petrol ration Britain could be expected to be, and if it was the usual black market business, Harry didn't see how he could be expected to help. Oh, sorry to hear about this, Uncle. What's the trouble? Uh, it's a long story. I'm coming to the library, and we'll talk it over. Homer Ferguson's library occupied the entire west wing of the somewhat decrepit building. Harry believed that bats nested in the rafters, but he had never been able to prove it. When Homer had cleared a table by the simple expedient of tilting all the books off onto the floor, he whistled three times, a voice-operated relay tripped somewhere, and a gloomy Cornish voice drifted out of a concealed loudspeaker. Yes, Mr. Ferguson? Made a send across a bottle of the new whiskey. There was no reply except an audible sniff. But a moment later there came a creaking and clanking, and a couple of square feet of library shelving slid aside to reveal a conveyor belt. I can't get Mater to come into the library, complained Homer, lifting out a loaded tray. She's afraid of Burnash, although he's perfectly harmless. Harry found it hard not to feel sympathy for the invisible Mailer. All six feet of Boanerge was draped over the case holding the Encyclopedia Britannica, and a bulge amidships indicated that he had dined recently. What do you think of the whiskey? asked Homer when Harry had sampled some and started to gasp for breath. It's, uh, it, well, I, I don't know what to say. It's, phew, oh, rather strong. I never thought, oh, don't take any notice of the label on the bottle. This brand never saw Scotland, and that's what all the trouble's about. I made it right here on the premises. Uncle, yes, I know it's against the law and all that sort of nonsense, but you can't get any good whiskey these days. It all goes for export. It seemed to me that I was being patriotic, making my own, so that there was more left for the dollar drive. But the excise people don't see it that way. I think you'd better let me have the whole story, said Harry. He was gloomily sure that there was nothing he could do to get his uncle out of this scrape. Homer had always been fond of the bottle, and wartime shortages had hit him badly. He was also, as has been hinted, disinclined to give away money, and for a long time he had resented the fact that he had to pay a tax of several hundred percent on a bottle of whiskey. When he couldn't get his own supply any more, he had decided it was time to act. The district he was living in probably had a good deal to do with his decision. For some centuries, the customs and excise had waged a never-ending battle with the Cornish fisherfolk. It was rumoured that the last incumbent of the old vicarage had possessed the finest cellar in the district, next to that of the bishop himself, and had never paid a penny in duty on it. So Uncle Homer merely felt he was carrying on an old and noble tradition. There was little doubt, moreover, that the spirit of pure scientific inquiry also inspired him. He felt sure that this business about being aged in wood for seven years was all rubbish, and was confident that he could do a better job with ultrasonics and ultraviolet rays. The experiment went well for a few weeks, but late one evening there was one of those unfortunate accidents that will happen even in the best conducted laboratories, and before Uncle knew what had happened, he was draped over a beam, while the grounds of the vicarage were littered with pieces of copper tubing. Even then it would not have mattered much, had not the local home guard been practicing in the neighborhood. As soon as they heard the explosion, they immediately went into action. Sten guns at the ready. Had the invasion started? If so, they'd soon fix it. They were a little disappointed to discover that it was only Uncle, but as they were used to his experiments, they weren't in the least surprised at what had happened. Unfortunately for Uncle... The lieutenant in charge of the squad happened to be the local exciseman, and the combined evidence of his nose and his eyes told him the story in a flash. So, tomorrow, said Uncle Homer, looking rather like a small boy who had been caught stealing candy, 
I have to go before the bench, charged with possessing an illegal still. I should have thought, replied Harry, that was a matter for the assizes, not the local magistrates. We do things our own way here, answered Homer, with more than a touch of pride. Harry was soon to discover how true this was. They got little sleep that night, as Homer outlined his defence, overcame Harry's objections, and hastily assembled the apparatus he intended to produce in court. An event like this, he explained, is always impressed by experts. Have we dared? I'd like to say you were someone from the war office, but they would check up on that, so we'll just tell them the truth. About our qualifications, that is. Well, thank you, said Harry. And suppose my college finds out what I'm doing. Well, you won't claim to be acting for anyone except yourself. The whole thing is a private venture. I'll say it is, said Harry. The next morning, they loaded their gear into Homer's ancient Austin and drove into the village. The bench was sitting in one of the classrooms of the local school, and Harry felt that time had rolled back a few years, and he was about to have an unpleasant interview with his old headmaster. We're in luck, whispered Homer, as they were ushered into their cramped seats. Major Fotheringham is in the chair. He's a good friend of mine. That would help a lot, Harry agreed. But there were two other justices on the bench as well, and one friend in court would hardly be sufficient. Eloquence, not influence, was the only thing that could save the day. The courtroom was crowded, and Harry found it surprising that so many people had managed to get away from work long enough to watch the case. And then he realized the local interest that it would have aroused, in view of the fact that, in normal times at least, Smuggling was a major industry in these parts. He was not sure whether that would mean a sympathetic audience. The natives might well regard Homer's form of private enterprise as unfair competition. Now, on the other hand, they probably approved on general principles with anything that put the excisemen's noses out of joint. The charge was read by the clerk of the court, and the somewhat damning evidence produced. Pieces of copper tubing were solemnly inspected by the justices, each of whom in turn looked severely at Uncle Homer. Harry began to see his hypothetical inheritance becoming even more doubtful. When the case for the prosecution was completed, Major Fotheringham turned to Homer. This appears to be a very serious matter, Mr. Ferguson. I hope you have a satisfactory explanation. I have, Your Honour, replied the defendant in a tone that practically reeked of injured innocence. It was amusing to see his Honour's look of relief, and the momentary frown, quickly replaced by calm confidence, that passed across the face of H.M. Customs and Excise. Do you wish to have a legal representative? I notice that you have not brought one with you. It won't be necessary. The whole case is founded on such a trivial misunderstanding that it can be cleared up without complications like that. I don't wish to incur the prosecution in unnecessary costs. This frontal onslaught brought a murmur from the body of the court and a flush to the cheeks of the customs man. For the first time he began to look a little unsure of himself. If Ferguson thought the Crown would be paying costs... He must have a pretty good case. Of course, he might only be bluffing. Homer waited until the mild stir had died away before creating a considerably greater one. I have called a scientific expert to explain what happened at the vicarage, he said. And owing to the nature of the evidence, I must ask for security reasons that the rest of the proceedings be in camera. You want me to clear the court, said the chairman incredulously. I am afraid so, sir. My colleague, Dr. Purvis, feels that the fewer people concerned in this case, the better. When you have heard the evidence, I think you will agree with them. If I may say so, it is a great pity that it has already attracted so much publicity. I am afraid it may bring certain, uh, 
confidential matters to the wrong ears. Homer glared at the customs officer, who fidgeted uncomfortably in his seat. Oh, very well, said Major Fotheringham. Uh, this is all very regular, but uh, we live in irregular times. Uh, Mr. Clark, clear the court. After some grumbling and confusion, and an overruled protest from the prosecution, the order was carried out. Then, under the interested gaze of the dozen people left in the room, Harry Purvis uncovered the apparatus he had unloaded from the baby Austin. After his qualifications had been presented to the court, he took the witness stand. I wish to explain, Your Honour, he began, that I have been engaged on explosives research, and that is why I happen to be acquainted with the defendant's work. The opening part of this statement was perfectly true. It was about the last thing said that day that was. You mean bombs and, and so forth? Precisely. But on a fundamental level, we are always looking for new and better types of explosives, as you can imagine. Moreover, we in government research and the academic world are continually on the lookout for good ideas from outside sources. And quite recently, Unc uh, Mr. Ferguson wrote to us with a most interesting suggestion for a completely new type of explosive. The interesting thing about it was that it employed non-explosive materials, such as sugar, starch, and so on. Eh? said the German. A non-explosive explosive? That's impossible. Harry smiled sweetly. Well, I know, sir, that is one's immediate reaction. But like most great ideas, this has the simplicity of genius. I am afraid, however, that I shall have to do a little explaining to make my point. The bench looked very attentive, and also a little alarmed. Harry surmised that it had probably encountered expert witnesses before. He walked over to a table that had been set up in the middle of the courtroom, and which was now covered with flasks, piping, and bottles of liquid. I hope, uh, Dr. Purvis, said the chairman nervously, uh, that you're not going to do anything dangerous. Of course not, sir. I merely wish to demonstrate some basic scientific principles. Once again, I wish to stress the importance of keeping this between these four walls. He paused solemnly and everyone looked duly impressed. And Mr. Ferguson, he began, is proposing to tap one of the fundamental forces of nature. It is a force on which every living thing depends, a force, gentlemen, which keeps you alive, even though you may never have heard of it. He moved over to the table and took up his position beside the flasks and bottles. Have you ever stopped to consider, he said, how the sap manages to reach the highest leaf of a tall tree. It takes a lot of force to pump water a hundred, sometimes over three hundred feet from the ground. Where does that force come from? I'll show you with this practical example. Here I have a strong container divided into two parts by a porous membrane. On one side of the membrane is pure water. On the other side, a concentrated solution of sugar and other chemicals which I do not propose to specify. Under these conditions, a pressure is set up known as osmotic pressure. The pure water tries to pass through the membrane, as if to dilute the solution on the other side. I've now sealed the container, and you'll notice the pressure gauge here on the right. See how the pointer's going up? That's osmotic pressure for you. This same force acts through the cell walls in our bodies, causing fluid movement. It drives the sap up the trunks of trees, from the roots to the topmost branches. It's a universal force, and a powerful one. To Mr. Ferguson must go the credit of first attempting to harness it. Harry paused impressively and looked round the court. Mr. Ferguson, he said, was attempting to develop the osmotic bomb. It took some time for this to sink in. Then Major Fotheringham leaned forward and said in a hushed voice,
are we to presume that he had succeeded in manufacturing this bomb and that it exploded in his workshop? Precisely, Your Honour. It is a pleasure, an unusual pleasure, I might say, to present a case to so perspicacious a court. Mr. Ferguson had succeeded, and he was preparing to report his method to us when, owing to an unfortunate oversight, a safety device attached to the bomb failed to operate. The results you all know. I think you will need no further evidence of the power of this weapon, and you will realize its importance when I point out that the solutions it contains are all extremely common chemicals. Major Fotheringham, looking a little puzzled, turned to the prosecution lawyer. Um, Mr. Whiting, he said, have you any questions to ask the witness? I certainly have, Your Honor. I've never heard such a ridiculous... You will please confine yourself to questions of fact. Oh, very good, Your Honor. May I ask the witness how he accounts for the large quantity of alcohol vapor immediately after the explosion? I rather doubt if the inspector's nose was capable of accurate quantitative analysis. But admittedly, there was some alcohol vapor, at least. The solution used in the bomb contained about 25%. By employing dilute alcohol, the mobility of the inorganic ions is restricted and the osmotic pressure raised. A desirable effect, of course. That should hold them for a while, thought Harry. He was right. It was a good couple of minutes before the second question. Then the prosecution spokesman waved one of the pieces of copper tubing in the air. What function did these carry out? he said in as nasty a tone of voice as he could manage. Harry affected not to notice the sneer. Manometer tubing for the pressure gauges, he replied promptly. The bench, it was clear, was already far out of its depth. This was just where Harry wanted it to be. But the prosecution still had one card up its sleeve. There was a furtive whispering between the exciseman and his legal eagle. Harry looked nervously at Uncle Homer, who shrugged his shoulders with a don't-ask-me gesture. I have some additional evidence I wish to present to the court, said the customs lawyer briskly, as a bulky brown paper parcel was hoisted onto the table. Is this in order, Your Honour? protested Harry. All evidence against my uh, colleague should already have been presented. I withdraw my statements. The lawyer interjected swiftly. Let us say that this is not evidence for this case, but material for later proceedings. He paused ominously to let that sink in. Nevertheless, if Mr. Ferguson can give a satisfactory answer to our question now, this whole business can be cleared up right away. It was obvious that the last thing the speaker expected or hoped for was such a satisfactory explanation. He unwrapped the brown paper, and there were three bottles of a famous brand of whiskey. Uh, uh, said Uncle Homer. I was wondering. Mr. Ferguson, said the chairman of the bench, there is no need for you to make any statement unless you wish. Harry Purvis shot Major Fotheringham a grateful glance. He guessed what had happened. The prosecution had, when prowling through the ruins of Uncle's laboratory, acquired some bottles of his home brew. Their action was probably illegal, since they would not have had a search warrant, hence the reluctance in producing the evidence. The case had seemed sufficiently clear-cut without it. It certainly appeared pretty clear-cut now. These bottles, said the representative of the Crown, do not contain the brand advertised on the label. They have obviously been used as convenient receptacles for the defendant's, shall we say, chemical solutions. He gave Harry Purvis an unsympathetic glance. We have had these solutions analysed with most interesting results. Apart from an abnormally high alcohol concentration, the contents of these bottles are virtually indistinguishable from... He never had time to finish his unsolicited and certainly unwanted testimonial to Uncle Homer's skill. 
For at that moment, Harry Purvis became aware of an ominous whistling sound. At first he thought it was a falling bomb, but that seemed unlikely, as there had been no air raid warning. Then he realized that the whistling came from close at hand, from the courtroom table, in fact. Take cover! he yelled. The court went into recess with a speed never matched in the annals of British law. The three justices disappeared behind the dais. Those in the body of the room burrowed into the floor or sheltered under desks. For a protracted, anguished moment, nothing happened, and Harry wondered if he had given a false alarm. Then there was a dull, peculiarly muffled explosion, a great tinkling of glass, and a smell like a blitz brewery. Slowly, the court emerged from shelter. The osmotic bomb had proved its power. More important still, it had destroyed the evidence for the prosecution. The bench was none too happy about dismissing the case. It felt with good reason that its dignity had been assailed. Moreover, each one of the justices would have to do some fast talking when he got home. The mist of alcohol had penetrated everything. Though the clerk of the court rushed round opening windows, none of which, oddly enough, had been broken, the fumes seemed reluctant to disperse. Harry Purvis, as he removed pieces of bottle glass from his hair, wondered if there would be some intoxicated pupils in class tomorrow. Major Fotheringham, however, was undoubtedly a real sport, and as they filed out of the devastated courtroom, Harry heard him say to his uncle, uh, Look here, Ferguson, it'll be ages before we can get those Molotov cocktails we've been promised by the war office. What about making some of these bombs of yours for the home guard? If they don't knock out a tank, at least they'll make the crew drunk and incapable. I'll certainly think about it, Major, replied Uncle Homer, who still seemed a little dazed by the turn of events. He recovered somewhat as they drove back to the vicarage along the narrow winding lanes with their high walls and unmortared stone. I hope, Uncle, remarked Henry, when they had reached a relatively straight stretch and it seemed safe to talk to the driver, that you don't intend to rebuild that still. They'll be watching you like hawks, and you won't get away with it again. Very well, said Uncle, a little sulkily. Confound these bricks! I had them fixed only just before the war! Hey! cried Harry. Watch out! It was too late. They had come to a crossroads at which a brand new halt sign had been erected. Uncle braked hard, but for a moment nothing happened. Then the wheels on the left seized up, while those on the right continued gaily spinning. The car did a hairpin bend, luckily without turning over, and ended in the ditch, pointing in the direction from which it had come. Harry looked reproachfully at his uncle. He was about to frame a suitable reprimand when a motorcycle came out of the side turning and drew up to them. It was not going to be their lucky day, after all. The village police sergeant had been lurking in ambush, waiting to catch motorists at the new sign. He parked his machine by the roadside and leaned in through the window of the Austin. You're right, Mr. Ferguson, he said. Then his nose wrinkled up and he looked like Jove about to deliver a thunderbolt. This won't do, he said. I'll have to put you on a charge. Driving under the influence is a very serious business. Well, I've, I've, I've not had to drop all day, protested Uncle waving an alcohol-sodden sleeve under the sergeant's twitching nose. "'You expect me to believe that?' snorted the irate policeman, pulling out his notebook. "'I'm afraid you'll have to come to the station with me. Is your friend sober enough to drive?' Harry Purvis didn't answer for a moment. He was too busy beating his head against the dashboard. "'Well?' we asked Harry. "'What did they do to your uncle?' Oh, he got fined five pounds, and had his license endorsed for drunken driving. Major Fotheringham wasn't in the chair, unfortunately, when the case came up, but the other two justices were still on the bench. I guess they felt that even if he was innocent this time, there was a limit to everything.'
And did he ever get any of his money? Oh, no fear. He was grateful, of course. And he's told me that I mentioned in his will. But when I saw him last, what do you think he was doing? He was searching for the elixir of life. Harry sighed at the overwhelming injustice of things. Sometimes, he said gloomily, I'm afraid he's found it. The doctors say he's the healthiest seventy-year-old they've ever seen. So all I got out of the whole affair was some interesting memories and a hangover. A hangover? asked Charlie Willis. Yes, replied Harry, a faraway look in his eye. You see... The excise man hadn't seized all the evidence. We had to, uh, destroy the rest. It took us the best part of a week. We invented all sorts of things during that time, but we never discovered what they were. The Next Tenants First published in Satellite, February 1957 Collected in Tales from the White Heart. The number of mad scientists who wish to conquer the world, said Harry Purvis, looking thoughtfully at his beer, has been grossly exaggerated. In fact, I can remember encountering only a single one. Then there couldn't have been many others, commented Bill Temple a little acidly. It's not the sort of thing one would be likely to forget. I suppose not, replied Harry, with that air of irrefragable innocence which is so disconcerting to his critics. And, as a matter of fact, this scientist wasn't really mad. There was no doubt, though, that he was out to conquer the world, nor, if you want to be really precise, to let the world be conquered. And by whom? asked George Whitley. The Martians? or the well-known little green men from Venus. Neither of them. He was collaborating with someone a lot nearer home. You'll realize who I mean when I tell you he was a myrmecologist. Uh, which what? asked George. Let him get on with the story, said Drew from the other side of the bar. It's past ten, and if I can't get you all out by closing time this week, I'll lose my license. Thank you said Harry with dignity, handing over his glass for a refill. This all happened about two years ago, when I was on a mission in the Pacific. It was rather hush-hush, but in view of what's happened since, there's no harm in talking about it. Three of us scientists were landed on a certain Pacific atoll not a thousand miles from Bikini, and given a week to set up some detection equipment. It was intended, of course, to keep an eye on our good friends and allies when they started playing with thermonuclear reactions, to pick some crumbs from the AEC's table, as it were. The Russians, naturally, were doing the same thing, and occasionally we ran into each other, and then both sides would pretend that there was nobody here but us chickens. This atoll was supposed to be uninhabited, but this was a considerable error. It actually had a population of several hundred millions. What? gasped everybody. Several hundred millions, continued Purvis calmly. Of which number, one was human. I came across him when I went inland one day to have a look at the scenery. Inland? asked George Whitley. I thought you said it was an atoll. How can a ring of coral... It was a very plump atoll, said Harry firmly. Anyway, who's telling the story? He waited defiantly for a moment until he had the right of way again. Here I was then, walking up a charming little river course underneath the coconut palms, when, to my great surprise, I came across a water wheel, a very modern-looking one, driving a dynamo. If I'd been sensible, I suppose I'd have gone back and told my companions, but I couldn't resist the challenge, and decided to do some reconnoitering on my own. I remembered that there was still supposed to be Japanese troops around who didn't know that the war was over, but that explanation seemed a bit unlikely. 
I followed the power line up the hill, and there, on the other side, was a low, whitewashed building set in a large clearing. All over this clearing were tall, irregular mounds of earth, linked together with a network of wires. It was one of the most baffling sights I've ever seen, and I stood and stared for a good ten minutes, trying to decide what was going on. The longer I looked, the less sense it seemed to make. I was debating what to do when a tall, white-haired man came out of the building and walked over to one of the mounds. He was carrying some kind of apparatus and had a pair of earphones slung around his neck, so I guessed that he was using a Geiger counter. It was just about then that I realized what those tall mounds were. They were termitaries. The skyscrapers, in comparison to their makers, far taller than the Empire State Building, in which the so-called white ants live. I watched with great interest, but complete bafflement, while the elderly scientist inserted his apparatus into the base of the termitary, listened intently for a moment, and then walked back towards the building. Though by this time I was so curious that I decided to make my presence known. Whatever research was going on here obviously had nothing to do with international politics, so I was the only one who'd have anything to hide. You'll appreciate later just what a miscalculation that was. I yelled for attention and walked down the hill waving my arms. The stranger halted and watched me approaching. He didn't look particularly surprised. As I came closer... I saw that he had a straggling moustache that gave him a faintly oriental appearance. He was about sixty years old and carried himself very erect. Though he was wearing nothing but a pair of shorts, he looked so dignified that I felt rather ashamed of my noisy approach. Uh, good morning, I said apologetically. I didn't know that there was anyone else on this island. I'm with a... Um, uh, the scientific survey party over on the other side. At this, the stranger's eyes lit up. Ah, he said in almost perfect English. A fellow scientist, I am very pleased to meet you. Come into the house. I followed gladly enough. I was pretty hot after my scramble, and I found that the building was simply one large lab. In a corner was a bed and a couple of chairs together with a stove and one of those folding wash basins that campers use. That seemed to sum up the living arrangements. But everything was very neat and tidy. My unknown friend seemed to be a recluse, but he believed in keeping up appearances. I introduced myself first, and, as I'd hoped, he promptly responded. He was one Professor Takato a biologist from a leading Japanese university. He didn't look particularly Japanese, apart from the moustache I've mentioned. With his erect, dignified bearing, he reminded me more of an old Kentucky colonel I once knew. After he'd given me some unfamiliar but refreshing wine, we sat and talked for a couple of hours. Like most scientists, he seemed happy to meet someone who would appreciate his work, it was true that my interests lay in physics and chemistry, rather than on the biological side, but I found Professor Takato's research quite fascinating. I don't suppose you know much about termites, so I'll remind you of the salient facts. They're among the most highly evolved of the social insects, and live in vast colonies throughout the tropics. They can't stand cold weather, nor, oddly enough, can they endure direct sunlight. When they have to get from one place to another, they construct little covered roadways. They seem to have some unknown and almost instantaneous means of communication. And though the individual termites are pretty helpless and dumb, a whole colony behaves like an intelligent animal. Some writers have drawn comparisons between a termitary and a human body, which is also composed of individual living cells making up an entity much higher than the basic units. The termites are often called white ants, but that's a completely incorrect name, as they aren't ants at all, but quite a different species of insect. Or should I say genus? I'm pretty vague about this sort of thing. Well, excuse this little lecture. 
But after I'd listened to Toccato for a while, I began to get quite enthusiastic about termites myself. Did you know, for example, that they not only cultivate gardens, but also keep cows? Well, insect cows, of course, and milk them. Yes, they're sophisticated little devils, even though they do it all by instinct. But I'd better tell you something about the professor. Although he was alone at the moment, and had lived on the island for several years, he had a number of assistants who brought equipment from Japan and helped him in his work. His first great achievement was to do for the termites what von Frisch had done with bees. He'd learned their language. It was much more complex than the system of communication that bees use, which, as you probably know, is based on dancing. I understood that the network of wires linking the termitories to the lab not only enabled Professor Toccato to listen to the termites talking among each other, but also permitted him to speak to them. That's not really as fantastic as it sounds if you use the word speak in its widest sense. We speak to a good many animals, not always with our voices, by any means. When you throw a stick for your dog and expect him to run and fetch it, that's a form of speech sign language. The professor, I gathered, had worked out some kind of code which the termites understood, though how efficient it was at communicating ideas, I didn't know. I came back each day, when I could spare the time, and by the end of the week we were firm friends. It may surprise you that I was able to conceal these visits from my colleagues, but the island was quite large, and we each did a lot of exploring. I felt somehow that Professor Toccato was my private property, and did not wish to expose him to the curiosity of my companions. They were rather uncouth characters, graduates of some provincial university like Oxford or Cambridge. Well, I'm glad to say that I was able to give the professor a certain amount of assistance, fixing his radio and lining up some of his electronic gear. He used radioactive tracers a good deal to follow individual termites around. He'd been tracking one with a Geiger counter when I first met him, in fact. Four or five days after we met, his counters started to go haywire, and the equipment we'd set up began to reel in its recordings. Takato guessed what had happened. He'd never asked me exactly what I was doing on the island, but I think he knew. When I greeted him, he switched on his counters and let me listen to the roar of radiation. There had been some radioactive fallout, not enough to be dangerous, but sufficient to bring the background way up. I think, he said softly, that you physicists are playing with your toys again and very big ones this time. I'm afraid you're right, I answered. We wouldn't be sure until the readings had been analysed, but it looked as if Teller and his team had started the hydrogen reaction. Before long we'll be able to make the first A-bombs look like damp squibs. My family, said Professor Toccato without any emotion, was at Nagasaki. There wasn't a great deal I could say to that, and I was glad when he went on to add, Have you ever wondered who will take over when we are finished? Your termites, I said half facetiously. He seemed to hesitate for a moment, then he said quietly, Come with me. I have not shown you everything. We walked over to a corner of the lab where some equipment lay concealed beneath dust sheets, and the professor uncovered a rather curious piece of apparatus. At first sight, it looked like one of the manipulators used for remote handling of dangerously radioactive materials. There were hand grips that conveyed movement through rods and levers, but everything seemed to focus on a small box a few inches on a side. What is it? I asked. It's a micromanipulator. The French developed them for biological work. There aren't many around yet. Then I remembered... These were devices with which, by the use of suitable reduction gearing, one could carry out the most incredibly delicate operations. You moved your finger an inch, and the tool you were controlling moved a thousandth of an inch. <laughs>
The French scientists who had developed this technique had built tiny forges on which they could construct minute scalpels and tweezers from fused glass. Working entirely through microscopes, they had been able to dissect individual cells. Removing an appendix from a turbite, in the highly doubtful event of the insect possessing one, would be child's play with such an instrument. I am not very skilled at using the manipulator, confessed Takato. One of my assistants does all the work with it. I have shown no one else this, but you have been very helpful. Uh, come with me, please. We went out into the open and walked past the avenues of tall, cement-hard mounds. They were not all of the same architectural design, for there are many different kinds of termites. Some, indeed, don't build mounds at all. I felt rather like a giant walking through Manhattan, for these were skyscrapers, each with its own teeming population. There was a small metal, uh, not wooden, the termites would sooner fix that, a hut beside one of the mounds, and as we entered it, the glare of sunlight was banished. The professor threw a switch, and a faint red glow enabled me to see various types of optical equipment. They hate light, he said. So it's a great problem observing them. We solved it by using infrared. This is an image converter of the type that was used in the war for operations at night. You know about them? Well, of course, I said. Snipers had them fixed on their rifles so that they could go sharpshooting in the dark. Very ingenious things. I'm glad you found a civilized use for them. It was a long time before Professor Toccato found what he wanted. He seemed to be steering some kind of periscope arrangement, probing through the corridors of the termite city. And then he said, Quick, before they've gone. I moved over and took his position. It was a second or so before my eye focused properly, and longer still before I understood the scale of the picture I was seeing. Then I saw six termites, greatly enlarged, moving rather rapidly across the field of vision. They were traveling in a group, like the huskies forming a dog team, and that was a very good analogy, because they were towing a sledge. I was so astonished that I never even noticed what kind of load they were moving. When they had vanished from sight, I turned to Professor Toccato. My eyes had now grown accustomed to the faint red glow, and I could see him quite well. So that's the sort of tool you've been building with your micromanipulator, I said. It's amazing. I'd never have believed it. But that is nothing, replied the Professor. Performing, please, we'll pull a cart around. I haven't told you what is so important. We only made a few of those sledges. The one you saw, they constructed themselves. He let that sink in. It took some time. Then he continued quietly, but with a kind of controlled enthusiasm in his voice. Remember that the termites, as individuals, have virtually no intelligence. But the colony as a whole, is a very high type of organism, and an immortal one, barring accidents. It froze in its present instinctive pattern millions of years before man was born, and by itself it can never escape from its present sterile perfection. It has reached a dead end, because it has no tools, no effective way of controlling nature. I have given it the lever to increase its power, and now the sledge to improve its efficiency. I have thought of the wheel, but it is best to let that wait for a later stage. It would not be very useful now. The results have exceeded my expectations. I started with this termitary alone, but now they all have the same tools. They have taught each other, and that proves that they can cooperate. True, they have wars, but not when there is enough food for all as there is here. But you cannot judge the termitary by human standards. What I hope to do is to jolt its rigid, frozen culture, to knock it out of the groove in which it has stuck for so many millions of years.'
I will give it more tools, more new techniques, and before I die, I hope to see it beginning to invent things for itself. Why are you doing this? I asked, for I knew that there was more than mere scientific curiosity here. Because I do not believe that man will survive. Yet I hope to preserve some of the things he has discovered. If he is to be a dead end, I think that another race should be given a helping hand. Do you know why I chose this island? It was so that my experiment should remain isolated. My super termite, if it ever evolves, will have to remain here until it has reached a very high level of attainment, until it can cross the Pacific. In fact, there is another possibility. Man has no rival on this planet. I think it may do him good to have one. It may be his salvation. I could think of nothing to say. This glimpse of the professor's dreams was so overwhelming, and yet, in view of what I had just seen, so convincing. For I knew that Professor Takato was not mad. He was a visionary, and there was a sublime detachment about his outlook, but it was based on a secure foundation of scientific achievement. And it was not that he was hostile to mankind, he was sorry for it. He simply believed that humanity had shot its boat and wished to save something from the wreckage. I could not feel it in my heart to blame him. We must have been in that little hut for a long time, exploring possible futures. I remember suggesting that perhaps there might be some kind of mutual understanding, since two cultures so utterly dissimilar as man and termite need have no cause for conflict. But I couldn't really believe this. And if a contest comes... I'm not certain who will win. For what use would man's weapons be against an intelligent enemy who could lay waste all the wheat fields and all the rice crops in the world? When we came out into the open once more, it was almost dusk. It was then that the professor made his final revelation. In a few weeks, he said, I'm going to take the biggest step of all. And what is that? I asked. Cannot you guess? I am going to give them fire. Those words did something to my spine. I felt a chill that had nothing to do with the oncoming night. The glorious sunset that was taking place beyond the palms seemed symbolic, and suddenly I realized that the symbolism was even deeper than I had thought. That sunset was one of the most beautiful I had ever seen, and it was partly of man's making. Up there in the stratosphere, the dust of an island that had died this day was encircling the earth. My race had taken a great step forward, but did it matter now? I am going to give them fire. Somehow I never doubted that the professor would succeed, and when he had done so, the forces that my own race had just unleashed would not save it. The flying boat came to collect us the next day, and I did not see Takato again. He is still there, and I think he is the most important man in the world. While our politicians wrangle, he is making us obsolete. Do you think that someone ought to stop him? There may still be time. I've often thought about it, but I've never been able to think of a really convincing reason why I should interfere. Once or twice I nearly made up my mind, but then I'd pick up the newspaper and see the headlines. I think we should let them have the chance. I don't see how they could make a worse job of it than we've done. The Defenestration of Ermintrude Inch First published in Tales from the White Heart an unusual story from the White Heart, in which Harry Purvis seemingly meets his match when his wife discovers the location of his quantum mechanics lectures. It also chronicles the move from the White Heart to the sphere, matching the move from the White Horse to the globe, following the landlord, Lou Mordecai. And now I have a short, sad duty to perform. 
One of the many mysteries about Harry Purvis, who was so informative in every other direction, was the existence or otherwise of a Mrs. Purvis. It was true that he wore no wedding ring, but that means little nowadays. Almost as little, as an hotel proprietor will tell you, as does the reverse. In a number of his tales, Harry had shown distinct evidence of some hostility towards what a Polish friend of mine, whose command of English did not match his gallantry, always referred to as ladies of the female sex. And it was by a curious coincidence that the very last story he ever told us first indicated and then proved conclusively Harry's marital status. I do not know who brought up the word defenestration, which is not, after all, one of the most commonly used abstractions in the language. It was probably one of the alarmingly erudite younger members of the White Hart clientele. Some of them are just out of college, and so make us old-timers feel very callow and ignorant. But from the word the discussion naturally passed to the deed. Had any of us ever been defenestrated? Did we know anyone who had? Yes, said Harry. It happened to a verbose lady I once knew. She was called Ermintrude, and was married to Osbert Inch, a sound engineer at the BBC. Osbert spent all his working hours listening to other people talking, and most of his free time listening to Ermintrude. Unfortunately, he couldn't switch her off at the turn of a knob, and so he very seldom had a chance of getting a word in edgeways. There are some women who appear sincerely unaware of the fact that they cannot stop talking, and are most surprised when anyone accuses them of monopolising the conversation. Ermintrude would start as soon as she woke up, change gear so that she could hear herself speak about the eight o'clock news, and continue unabated until Osbert thankfully left for work. A couple of years of this had almost reduced him to a nervous wreck, but one morning, when his wife was handicapped by a long-overdue attack of laryngitis, he made a spirited protest against her vocal monopoly. To his incredulous disbelief, she flatly refused to accept the charge. It appeared that to Ermintrude, time ceased to exist when she was talking, but she became extremely restive when anyone else held the stage. As soon as she had recovered her voice, she told Osbert how unfair it was of him to make such an unfounded accusation, and the argument would have been very acrimonious if it had been possible to have an argument with Ermintrude at all. This made Osbert an angry and also a desperate man. But he was an ingenious one, too, and it occurred to him that he could produce irrefutable evidence that Ermintrude talked a hundred words for every syllable he was able to utter. I mentioned that he was a sound engineer, and his room was fitted up with hi-fi set, tape recorder, and the usual electronic tools of his trade, some of which the BBC had unwittingly supplied. It did not take him very long to construct a piece of equipment which one might call a selective word counter. If you know anything about audio engineering, you'll appreciate how it could be done with suitable filters and dividing circuits. And if you don't, you'll have to take it for granted. What the apparatus did was simply this. A microphone picked up every word spoken in the Inch apartment. Osbert's deeper tones went one way and registered on a counter marked his, and Ermintrude's higher frequencies went the other direction and ended up on the counter marked hers. Within an hour of switching on, the score was as follows. His, 23... Hers, 2,530. As the numbers flicked across the counter dials, Ermintrude became more and more thoughtful, and at the same time more and more silent. Osbert, on the other hand, drinking the heady wine of victory, though to anyone else it would have looked like his morning cup of tea, began to make the most of his advantage and became quite talkative. By the time he had left for work, the counters had reflected the changing status in the household. His, 1,043, hers, 3,397. Just to show who was now the boss, Osbert left the apparatus switched on. He had always wondered if Ermintrude talked to herself as a purely automatic reflex, even when there was no one around to hear what she was saying. 
He had, by the way, thoughtfully taken the precaution of putting a lock on the counter so that his wife couldn't turn it off while he was out. He was a little disappointed to find that the figures were quite unaltered when he came home that evening, but thereafter the score soon started to mount again. It became a kind of game, though a deadly serious one, with each of the protagonists keeping one eye on the machine whenever either of them said a word. Ermintrude was clearly discomfited. Ever and again she would suffer a verbal relapse and increase her score by a couple of hundred before she brought herself to a halt by a supreme effort of self-control. Osbert, who still had such a lead that he could afford to be garrulous, amused himself by making occasional sardonic comments which were well worth the expenditure of a few score points. Although a measure of equality had been restored in the Inch household, the word counter had, if anything, increased the state of dissension. Presently, Ermintrude, who had a certain natural intelligence which some people might have called craftiness, made an appeal to her husband's better nature. She pointed out that neither of them was really behaving naturally while every word was being monitored and counted. Osbert had unfairly let her get her head, and was now being taciturn in a way that he would never have been had he not got the warning score continuously before his eyes. Though Osbert gagged at the sheer effrontery of this charge, he had to admit that the objection did contain an element of truth. The test would be fairer and more conclusive if neither of them could see the accumulating score if indeed they forgot all about the presence of the machine, and so behaved perfectly naturally, or at least as naturally as they could in the circumstances. After much argument they came to a compromise. Very sportingly, in his opinion, Osbert reset the dials to zero and sealed up the counter window so that no one could take a peek at the scores. They agreed to break the wax seals, on which they had both impressed their fingerprints, at the end of the week and to abide by the decision. Concealing the microphone under a table, Osbert moved the counter-equipment itself into his little workshop, so that the living room now bore no sign of the implacable electronic watchdog that was controlling the destiny of the inches. Thereafter, things slowly returned to normal. Ermintrude became as talkative as ever. But now Osbert didn't mind in the least, because he knew that every word she uttered was being patiently noted to be used as evidence against her. At the end of the week, his triumph would be complete. He could afford to allow himself the luxury of a couple of hundred words a day, knowing that Ermintrude used up this allowance in five minutes. The breaking of the seals was performed ceremonially at the end of an unusually talkative day, when Ermintrude had repeated verbatim three telephone conversations of excruciating banality, which it seemed had occupied most of her afternoon. Osbert had merely smiled and said, Yes, dear, at ten-minute intervals, meanwhile trying to imagine what excuse his wife would put forward when confronted by the damning evidence. Imagine, therefore, his feelings when the seals were removed to disclose the week's total. His... 143,567, hers 32,590. Osbert stared at the incredible figures with stunned disbelief. Something had gone wrong, but where? There must, he decided, have been a fault in the apparatus. It was annoying, very annoying, for he knew perfectly well that Ermintrude would never let him live it down, even if he proved conclusively that the counter had gone haywire. Ermintrude was still crowing victoriously when Osbert pushed her out of the room and started to dismantle his errant equipment. He was halfway through the job when he noticed something in his waste paper basket which he was sure he hadn't put there. It was a closed loop of tape a couple of feet long, and he was quite unable to account for its presence as he had not used the tape recorder for several days. He picked it up and as he did so, suspicion exploded into certainty. He glanced at the recorder. The switches, he was quite sure, were not as he had left them. Ermintrude was crafty, but she was also careless. Osbert had often complained that she never did a job properly, and here was the final proof. His den was littered with old tapes carrying unerased test passages he had recorded,
It had been no trouble at all for Ermintrude to locate one, snip off a few words, stick the ends together, switch to playback, and leave the machine running hour after hour in front of the microphone. Osbert was furious with himself for not having thought of so simple a ruse. If the tape had been strong enough, he would probably have strangled Ermintrude with it. Whether he tried to do anything of the sort is still uncertain. All we know is that she went out of the apartment window, and, of course, it could have been an accident, but there was no way of asking her, as the inches lived four storeys up. I know that defenestration is usually deliberate, and the coroner had some pointed words to say on the subject, but nobody could prove that Osbert pushed her, and the whole thing soon blew over. About a year later he married a charming little deaf and dumb girl, and they're one of the happiest couples I know. There was a long pause when Harry had finished. Whether out of disbelief or out of respect for the late Mrs. Inch, it would be hard to say. But before anyone could make a suitable comment, the door was thrown open, and a formidable blonde advanced into the private bar of the White Hart. It is seldom indeed that life arranges its climaxes as neatly as this. Harry Purvis turned very pale and tried in vain to hide himself in the crowd. He was instantly spotted and pinned down beneath a barrage of invective. "'So this,' we heard with interest, "'is where you've been giving your Wednesday evening lectures on quantum mechanics. "'I should have checked up with the university years ago.' "'Harry Purvis, you're a liar, and I don't mind if everybody knows it. "'And as for your friends,' she gave us all a scathing look, "'it's a long time since I've seen such a scruffy lot of tipplers.' "'Hey, just a minute,' protested Drew from the other side of the counter. "'She quelled him with a glance, then turned upon poor Harry again. "'Come along,' she said. "'You're going home. No, you needn't finish that drink. I'm sure you've already had more than enough.' Obediently, Harry Purvis picked up his briefcase and coat. "'Very well, Ermintrude,' he said meekly. "'I will not bore you with the long and still unsettled arguments as to whether Mrs. Purvis really was called Ermintrude, or whether Harry was so dazed that he automatically applied the name to her.' We all have our theories about that, as indeed we have about everything concerning Harry. All that matters now is the sad and indisputable fact that no one has ever seen him since that evening. It is just possible that he doesn't know where we meet nowadays, for a few months later the White Hart was taken over by a new management, and we all followed Drew, Lock, Stock and Barrel, particularly Barrel, to his new establishment. Our weekly sessions now take place at the Sphere, and for a long time many of us used to look up hopefully when the door opened to see if Harry had managed to escape and find his way back to us. It is indeed partly in the hope that he will see this book and hence discover our new location that I have gathered these tales together. Even those who never believed a word you spoke miss you, Harry. If you have to defenestrate Ermintrude to regain your freedom... Do it on a Wednesday evening between six and eleven, and there'll be forty people in the sphere who'll provide you with an alibi. But get back somehow. Things have never been quite the same since you went.'